What Xanthi learns from the charnel house makes the well burial even more confusing. Even during the worst outbreaks of disease, people were not just thrown into the nearest hole. The church taught that to be buried in a non-Christian way would lead to purgatory and hell. Medieval Norwich was a devout Christian city with over 40 parish churches. So, why weren't our 17 people buried with the usual care? Could it be because they weren't Christians? This is not a Christian burial. So that do we have people who are of not of the Christian faith? Is that why they're there? Or is it that they are some form of an outcast? Was it that people were afraid of them? I don't know, but they were not dealt with respect. With, with respect. The stable isotope data are back, and the results are intriguing. What they reveal is that the people found down the well had lived in the local area for many years. They were not just visiting. The trail suddenly now points towards non-Christian locals. And there's only one significant community from the time that matches that profile. Since 1135, Norwich was home to a thriving Jewish community, living just a few hundred yards from the well site. Xanthi meets up with Sophie Cabot, a specialist in Norwich's Jewish history, to find out more about this community. The Jewry in Norwich in the Middle Ages was in this position between the market and the castle. The castle's just up there, obviously the market's behind us, and the properties owned by Jews were concentrated in the area from White Lion Street here, right up to Little Orford Street at the far end of this block. Is the proximity of the Jewry to the castle important? It is, yeah. I mean, Norwich is a royal castle. Right. They were in England at the invitation of the Crown. Oh, I and see. And the Crown had direct legal control over them and their business. The Jews of Norwich had a very specific role. And why were they actually invited here by the King? Um, they were invited to lend money. And that was that primary function? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the time, the Christian interpretation of the Bible didn't allow Christians to lend money at interest. It was a sin called usury. Certainly, that's something that's not forbidden in Jewish law. So cash finance for big projects of any sort came from Jewish finance. Almost like banks? Yeah, like banks, basically. Does that mean they were all wealthy, then? Uh, some of them were extremely wealthy. There's one or two families who are incredibly rich and who are lending money on a national scale or really? even an international scale. Xanthi and Sophie visit the house of Isaac Jernet, which still stands in central Norwich. Despite having financed the cathedral, like many Jews across Christian Europe, the Jernets may have been subject to persecution. This is him here, shown at the top. With a crown. Wearing a crown, yes, showing, um, showing how important he is, and also with three, three profiles, three faces. Mean? It seems to mean that he's into everything, okay. that he's sort of got fingers in lots of pies. Oh, I see. And this is a caricature. This was yeah. drawn by a Christian, by a scribe in the Exchequer. They, as you can see, have rather caricatured faces, big noses. This yeah. is a hat that indicates that Moses is Jewish. Um, it, they're not kind drawings. No. And they're shown with this little devil who is yeah. tweaking them on the nose. Would you say that it's anti-Semitic? Because it's certainly not complimentary. There's resentment of the fact that Jews are making money. Um, some Jews, like Isaac, are making a huge amount of money. And they're doing it in a way that doesn't involve physical labour mm -hmm. or things that are necessarily recognised as work. Yeah. You know, it's a bit like people feel about bankers now. But Sophie thinks it's unlikely the skeletons in the well came from the Jewish community. On the site of the old synagogue, Sophie explains how they would have taken as much care over burial as Norwich's Christians. You would want it to be quick, so you would be ideally buried within 24 hours of really? your death. You would want it to be very simple, mm -hmm. so you would be washed and wrapped in a shroud. It's quite a simple ceremony, but it's got to be done right and in a dignified way. Well, you've kind of preempted my other question then. So you don't think that the Jewish community would have put other Jewish individuals in the well? No, I don't. That... I think it's pretty much impossible. I think if there were any Jews in the community to see that the dead got a proper burial, 
that's what they would do. If the bodies in the well were Jewish, this would point to foul play. It would suggest that their burial was deliberately careless or rushed. We know that across Britain and Europe at this time, Jewish people were increasingly victims of vicious hate attacks. Could this be what happened to our 17 people in Norwich? The DNA analysis is now complete. Aware that the case now risks grinding to a halt, the team hopes the results will provide a new lead. So how many did we take DNA samples from out of the, what was it, 17? I think we sampled eight, um, eight different in so individual from, from children through to adults. Yeah, we tried to get a range. Well, the DNA scenario. Will, will, will perhaps not only tell us about family, but if there is any other connection, genetic type connection, yep. you know, in, in a tight-knit group, then, then Ian might be able to tell us something about that as yep. well. Yeah. So, fingers crossed for DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Where our money's on DNA. They call Dr. Ian Barnes. There we are. Okay. We, yeah. we're Hello. Now. Hi. Yeah. We are looking today at medieval Norwich. We're hoping, against all hope, that you'll have something interesting to tell us. No pressure. <laughs> OK, so some pretty interesting news with this card. Oh, hey. good. Um, OK, so we actually got eight samples. Yeah. Of the eight, <laughs> one of them looks like there might be some contamination or maybe it's heavily damaged in some way. OK. So we'll disregard that one. The remaining seven, um, one of them has a very generic, standard European DNA type. Okay. One of them has uh, a DNA type which is relatively, relatively uncommon um, across Europe, but it's still just a generic European kind of sequence. Okay. The other five, however, have the same mitochondrial DNA sequence. Cool. So um, it looks like five that have the same sequence, um, you you could maybe assume or infer that they are directly and internally related, yeah. Right. Remarkably, five of the people down the well were related to each other. But that's not all the DNA results reveal. Now, the more unusual thing is that uh, there are sequences belong to a group um, which is relatively unusual in Europe. Um, it occurs at about something like 6%. Um, but it's a very high frequency, more like over 30% in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. Wow, that's interesting. That's, that's just amazing. Yeah. Isn't it? So that's for how many individuals? Five. So that's, that's five, five that we're happy with. It's an unexpected breakthrough in the case. The science has shown that at least five of the people down the well were from the Jewish community and likely family members. This is a really unusual situation for us. I think, I think this is a really unique uh, set of data that we've been able to get for these individuals. I'm not aware of uh, this has been done before, um, that we've been actually able to uh, pin them down to this level of um, specificity about uh, the ethnic group that they to come from. That's, that's, that's a good result. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much indeed. Bye. Bye-bye. I think what Ian has told us is truly amazing. Mm, it is. In, in that we, we clearly have family members. Mm -hmm. We've got a recognised group. And this is really pointing to something the most tragic of all of those it options as well, is, with yeah. 11 children. 11 children yeah. six of a adults. common maternal linked, DNA. Linked. Uh, the story now looks set to take a much darker turn. Um, there is a, a real temptation, I think, to go down the route of saying, because we've recognised the group, because we know they're a family, we're looking at something that's possibly more macabre, that we're looking at persecution. What we haven't yet got is, is the cause of death, or causes of death. I think we probably should look, go back to some of the bones and just have a look, because I'm concerned okay. that we haven't got any form of a trauma. I mean, dropping down the well would cause trauma. Um, and the prospect that, you know, maybe someone's gone down that well alive... Especially kids. ...is horrendous. <laughs> 
Sue's previous experience leads her to believe this could now be a case of mass murder. We're possibly talking about persecution. We're possibly talking about ethnic cleansing. And this all brings to mind very much the scenario that we dealt with during the Balkans war crimes. In terms of the, the brutality of the ethnic cleansing, it was felt that, you know, women and children, quite frankly, weren't worth wasting the bullet on. So that women were quite often bayoneted, for example. Pregnant women were bayoneted because that way you got rid of a woman because that wasn't important. And you got rid of the next generation because you really didn't want them to, to survive. So I, I know what sort of patterns I'm looking for if it was the same sort of situation where these individuals thrown down the well alive, where these individuals killed before they went down the well. With this new question in mind, Sue goes back to the bones again to examine the legs and spinal columns in minute detail and on one of the adults makes a crucial new discovery. If you open up and look at the surface of the um, 12th thoracic, you can see that we've got what looks like a burst fracture and it's coming over onto the surface here at the side and coming over onto the front there. That kind of thing happens when you get force either coming down onto legs or, of course, coming down onto head, so that what you're getting is, is a twisting, because that's what happens. You get a twisting, and the edge of one vertebra causes the fracture on the body. So, so the column is, is twisting, and as you impact, then what you get is, is the burst fractures. And there is similar damage to three of the adult leg bones. When we look particularly at these three bones, what we've got are radiating fracture lines passing up there. Um, and we've got little stepped areas of cortex there with a little fracture coming. Those, again, look like they're going to be perimortem. All of these indicating that what we have is our individuals where we have trauma to the extended leg. So whether it's going down, it must be landing on feet because you're getting, or landing on knees, of course it could be, but it's certainly trauma of force of impact. If you were falling into water, then I wouldn't expect to find this, this fracturing. I simply wouldn't because um, once you hit the water surface, then you've got almost like a cushioning, if you like. Um, the, these are fractures that I suspect are about landing on a hard surface. Sue believes this new evidence shows the well was actually dry and the adult victims were either killed just before or died very shortly after being thrown down the well. If they're down at the bottom of the well and these are the adults, then the children who are seeing no trauma may well have been thrown in on top of them. So we're not going to see perimortem fracturing as such with them because they're landing on a cushion off these adults. It's an alarming possible sequence of events. So, what would a modern homicide detective make of the circumstances of this case? Xanthi meets up with forensic pathologist Stuart Hamilton in Norwich Castle, which still has an intact well shaft. That's a long way, isn't it? That's a deep well, yes. Somebody falling in there or being pushed, whatever, yes. are they, are they going to survive that? They're not going to survive that fall. Um, if the simple impact at the bottom doesn't kill them outright, then the deceleration is going to tear arteries, it's going to damage organs, you're going to bleed to death fairly rapidly. I mean, Even that's... if you don't die straight away, you're not going to be alive for long. What would you say, if this were a forensic case presented to you, 17 people in a well, what would be your reading of it? One person in a well like that, to me, is something that's worrying. Two people is very worrying. 17 people is... it's a mass grave. Would I put a slightly different slant on this in your um, opinion if I were to tell you that all of the individuals were from a minority group? I, I think it's almost just common sense, really. This is saying that it is a particular group 
which seems to have been targeted. In this sort of case, it's the accumulation of the evidence. It's not just one piece or the other piece. It's, as it all builds up more and more and more, you simply can't ignore all of these things coming together. And he feels the lack of fatal trauma on all of the bones does not rule out murder. It's not uncommon that you can get homicides where there really would be nothing left on the bones. Relatively recently, I've dealt with a case where there was a homicidal knife assault with neck wounds, um, arteries were damaged, but no, no bony injuries at all. Stewart explains another cause of death that leaves no marks, but may fit with so many people being thrown down a narrow well. The average adult human weighs 70 kilograms, and that amount of pressure pressing down on you with multiple people, it's going to compress your chest. There is a, a well-recognised phenomenon that's called crush asphyxia, yeah. where you simply can't breathe yeah. because your chest is compressed, and that could be by a wall that's fallen on you, but it could be by a pile of human beings. And um, some of the disasters with the football stadia, yeah. people yeah. crushed against fences, you simply can't move your chest yeah. because it's crushed so tightly, and uh, it doesn't really bear thinking about in some ways. What's your gut instinct as to what happened? I, for these people's sake, what I hope happened was that they had their throats cut, that they were strangled, that they died a quick death and their bodies were disposed of. I fear that they were simply thrown down the well and left to die. It seems horrific. But if we're looking at 17 people who knew each other, perhaps even mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, then what events could have led to this? When Jewish people first moved to Britain following the Norman conquest of 1066, many settling in the key cities of London, Norwich and York, they enjoyed the protection of the crown. But just a few generations later, the story was very different. In England, protection wavered after Richard the Lionheart's coronation in 1190, and right across Europe, anti-Semitic propaganda was growing. Jews were accused of spreading plague, poisoning the water in wells, and even of using the blood of Christians in their rituals. But were our people somehow caught up in this? Xanthi travels to Bevis Marks in London, the oldest surviving synagogue in the country, to see Jewish historian Miri Rubin. You're aware by now that the DNA has come back and it's indicating that we're looking at a Jewish population. What does that mean to you? The first reaction is just shock. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, the mind boggles, you know. At least 17 people, so many children, yeah. so many really young children amongst mm -hmm. them. Um, well, it's just a, a horrific thought that, you know, with all the research, these sort of events can just go unnoticed. There are new types of dangers that develop in the late 12th, 13th centuries, new nasty narratives. You might even say that as Europe becomes more Christian, there is a real deepening of the, um, of the sort of the sense of Jewish evil. So the, it is, I'm afraid, a picture of worsening and ultimately the age of expulsions where England leaves in 1290, where the Jews are expelled mm -hmm. back to where they came from. To northern France. Yeah. So was that the kind of pinnacle of the unrest, the expulsion? You might say so. It's the king brought them in and the king kicked them out sort of thing. But Miri doesn't think they could have been part of the recorded acts of violence against Jews, nor the organised expulsion of Jews from England and Wales of 1290. I see no reason that the bodies will not have been relinquished to the Jewish community mm. to bury properly, nor indeed would I think that children would have been involved so conspicuously, mm -hmm. nor bodies that seem unbroken, undisturbed, unmutilated, like mm. the ones that we've found. That's the problem. She believes this points to another less well-known incident in the 1230s. Another flashpoint that occurred to me is the 1230s. The 1230s that saw, on a number of occasions, violence in the streets of Norwich against Jews, and indeed, and very important for this case, 
a burning of some Jewish houses by no rich people, because that would then suggest that um, maybe they died in their sleep from the inhalation of smoke, and thus they suffocated, because that would explain the, both the existence of the, sort of the, the children and uh, the fact that their bodies are not sort of mutilated in a way that you'd expect if it was just sort of real violence in the street and they were just felled. What's clear is that during this time, the Jews of Norwich could not rely on any protection from the crown. It's evident that royal officials, the sheriff and his bailiff, simply lost control of the city and indeed became the subject of bailiffs actually beaten up by Norwich people. So that suggests to me a situation where this, this system of control and scrutiny and protection that was painstakingly laid down over the decades had actually been disrupted in those years and actually royal officials could not contain what was unfolding. How many Jewish people were actually in Norwich at this time? Maybe 150 to 200 or so. 17 people then is actually quite a large proportion of this. You know, you think 17, you know, within a community, it's not that many, but this is massive, massive, isn't it? Really, really big. And the fact that these are families and children, this is a very, very big deal. This puts a totally new complexion onto the facial reconstructions, now nearing completion. So this is our Jewish group from the well in Norwich. And we've got adult male and young unidentified child in terms of sex. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl, five to seven years old. First, there is the adult male in his 40s. So the first thing that we'll look at in terms of characteristics are his ears, because we know um, that he's got adherent ears. In other words, he hasn't got any lobes. The ears just hit the straight, uh, straight onto the side of the head. And the bones around the mastoid process suggest that he had quite prominent ears, both upper and lower prominence. Then there is the five to seven year old child who could be related to the man. And we've added the muscle structure over and above the skull. And now we can look at some of the feature detail. Much more difficult with children because we don't have um, the strong features that we can take with adults. So most children tend to have similar up, small upturned noses. And the adult nose shape won't develop until after the age of eight is when it, when it starts to develop. And Caroline has discovered evidence which backs up the idea that they are family members. Now, interestingly, with this particular individual, he or she also had adherent ears, which means that uh, the child didn't have lobes, which is similar to the adult. The adult is showing that feature too. We know it's a, an hereditary feature, so if you have adherent ears, then one of your parents will have adherent ears as well. So the fact that they both have adherent ears I think is significant. The final task will be to apply likely skin, hair and eye colour. Did our man and child die from smoke inhalation when their houses were set fire to? Did they die once in the well from crush asphyxia? Or is there still another scenario which could explain the lack of fatal trauma on the bones. Xanthi has come to Clifford's Tower in York to take part in an annual service commemorating a very different sequence of events, which led to the tragic loss of many Jewish lives. In March 1190, about 150 Jews, men, women and children, sought protection in the royal castle here, now known as Clifford's Tower where they could usually rely on royal protection. The sheriff of Yorkshire decided to order the ejection of the Jews from the castle. And the families inside, deciding that the end had come, followed the tradition of heroic martyrdom, that they should take their own lives rather than die at the hands of the mob. The father of each household killed his own family and was then killed by the rabbi. The suicide method taking a knife to their throats, may well not have left a mark on the bones and would also fit with the idea that the people in the well are family members. It's a tragic possibility. It really hits home that I've seen some people who may have lived in a very similar situation, may have died in a similar way, and it really, 
it really humanises the whole story and tells me about what Norwich may have been like. We've seen it in York. Was it the same in Norwich? The team has reached the end of this investigation. The first examination of the bones took place in the depths of winter. It's now spring, and after months of work, it's time for the story these bones have told to be relayed back to the local community. Sue, Caroline and Xanthi return to Norwich and the medieval Guild Hall. Keen to hear their findings are those who originally excavated the site, experts who have assisted the investigation and members of the local community. I think a lot about it actually, yeah, it almost haunts me a bit because it's, it was such an unusual thing for me and quite, quite morbid in a way, um, but also, you know, I'd just like to know a bit more about them. To actually be able to put a face to one of these characters and actually bring the person to life, it'll be, I think, the most interesting for me. I should be, uh, yeah, interested to find out what we've, what we've been able to tell about them because they're a bit of a mystery. But how will the people of Norwich react to a story that brings back to life one of the city's darkest hours? What we, what we have started to do by bringing the science into this investigation is to allow us to look at the story from a different perspective. Why were they in a well? Were they alive or were they dead when they were placed in the well? And how do they fit into the history of Norwich at the time as we know it? Sue details some of the major twists that the investigation took, starting with the idea of disease. So it's not leprosy, it's not TB, it's not something that leaves a skeletal lesion. But that doesn't rule out all of the enteric diseases. But there was the stumbling block of unchristian burial. The most important thing is even though they died in vast numbers, they were still buried with the observance of Christian rites. And then the dramatic science that pushed the trail towards murder. So we need to talk about a real turning point, the point at which this investigation really did take a very, very different direction. We have to talk DNA. So we sent some bones off to Ian to have a look at the DNA. Out of the five of them where there was retrievable good information, what we have is a situation where the mitochondrial DNA, which is the DNA that's transferred down through a maternal line, effectively matches. So we have family members. That was really important, but what was even more important was that the DNA told us that the most likely group to which this individ these individuals belong are in fact Jewish. Wow. <laughs> wow, well, I'm actually quite shocked about that. <laughs> well, you weren't the only one. Um, if it's not a natural death, then I have to go back to where I was in Kosovo and to say, are we looking at a non-natural death? Are we looking at a murder scenario? Everyone is shocked at the idea that the people of Norwich once participated in the Europe-wide Jewish persecution. And usually this is the, the nice bit for everybody where I reveal a face, but it doesn't feel that way today. So let me first show you our male adult face. I think he's got a great face. It's a lovely face. Caroline's second reconstruction is even more emotive. One of the 11 children from the well. That child is just beautiful as well. It's perfect. He or she. They're just perfect. I think they're very, well, they're all a bit emotive now, actually. Um. 
we know what we might be looking at here is father and son or father and daughter or uncle and niece or uncle and nephew, etc. But a, a familial bond of some sort. And, and those might still be skeletons, but these are now people. It's a shocking revelation for everyone involved. It's very sad for Norwich. It changes the story of what we know about this community. You know, we don't know everything about this community, but what we thought we knew is changed by this, yeah. No, it was a big surprise, really. Um, it's not what I was expecting at all. Uh, I knew that we were going to learn something, and I, I really didn't think it was going to go in that direction. We had an idea that they died horribly, but um, the thought that it could be self-inflicted possibly is rather upsetting. Um, from what started out as a mysterious jumble of unidentified remains, we can now say that at least five of the people in the well were Jewish. We know that the children could likely have been from the same extended family or community, and tragically, that the trail points to them having possibly been murdered or pushed into suicide. This story throws new light on the horrific spate of persecution that ran through medieval England, which saw Jews used for their money, forced to remain social outcasts, and ultimately left without protection from the angry mob. The bones will now be handed back, perhaps for eventual reburial. Do you know, today was hard. I don't think I quite expected it to be as hard as it was. And it's how I feel every single time I have to talk to families today when we bring the news. And in forensic anthropology, the news that we bring is always bad news. It's the news that says, I'm sorry, your son's dead, your mother's dead, and you have to deal with the emotion. We were bringing the information to a community that was going to be seriously affected and seriously challenged by what we were going to say. But I knew that what we weren't doing was bringing closure. We were bringing almost the opposite. We were opening wounds that people were going to have to address. 